Hello, this is Benjamin D'Souza. I'm an electrophysiologist practicing at the University of Pennsylvania, and the following case is an ischemic ventricular tachycardia ablation performed at Presbyterian Medical Center for a patient who is 80 years old and has a known ischemic cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of 25%, as well as a known LAD occlusion and infarction who presents after having multiple episodes of ventricular tachycardia requiring ICD shocks despite the use of amiodarone. This case will highlight the importance of efficient workflow to safely and appropriately perform a VT ablation in an elderly patient with comorbidities. The major time for this case was approximately 1 hour and 50 minutes, with fluoro time of 4 minutes. Vascular access was obtained in which an 8 French sheath was placed in the right groin, which would be upsized to an agilis sheath for transeptal access, and in the left femoral vein, Cardio sound ice catheter was placed. The ice catheter was then placed in the right ventricle, and cardio sound contours were performed of the left ventricle. Of note, you can see the hyperlucency of what appears to be scar in the anterior septum of the left ventricle during the sound contours, a possible origin of the patient's VT. The individual contours of the interlateral and posterior medial papillary muscle were also drawn out. And if you separate these during your contours, it can sometimes assist in mapping without the use of fluoroscopy. The aortic cusps were also individually drawn out. And of note, you can see significant calcification across these cusps, which may be concerning in terms of retrograde aortic access. But for all of these RMT guided cases, transeptal access is preferred. Transeptal access was then performed with the use of ice and fluoroscopy guidance. The approach in this case was somewhat posterior with imaging of the pulmonary vein seen during transeptal access. While the use of a manual catheter may require either guiding a more anterior or posterior approach, with the use of a navigation system, this becomes less important. With the one caveat being that a somewhat high transeptal can sometimes impede the mapping as the agilis sheath or whatever sheath is being used at that time can sometimes be driven upwards while mapping. In this case, the ultimate transeptal access did tend to be somewhat higher than I would have normally preferred, but again with the use of robotic navigation and a robotic ablation catheter, that concern is less so than with a manual catheter. Following this, the sheath is directed in an anterior approach in which direction towards the mitral annulus, but not too far into the ventricle, is all that is required in order to engage the RMT catheter into the left ventricle. Prior to mapping, biventricular pacing was turned off so that the patient would be in their native conduction, and the ability to map late potentials is not obscured by the biventricular pacing. This patient's clinical ventricular tachycardia resulted in immediate ICD shocks with a rate that would not be unmappable without the use of either an impella or ECMO. Given his age and comorbidities, a substrate modification approach was taken in this case. Once the ablation catheter was placed into the left ventricle and magnets were brought in, mapping was then performed in order to grossly identify areas of scar with 5 millimeter settings used to move the catheter quickly to different geographic areas of the left ventricle, starting on the lateral wall and then moving to each individual location to identify a potential substrate. As you can see, moving in the left ventricle with wide strokes to be able to identify areas of potential 
signal abnormality and voltage abnormality with approximately 10 to 15 points performed in the left ventricle this entire process from when the magnets were brought in to a completion of a general map was approximately eight minutes. Based on the patient's history of coronary artery disease and previous LED infarction, this map showed a potential area of interest in the anteroceptal region. Other areas, including the inferior wall and infraceptum, appear to be spared based on the initial mapping. In this case, use of the patient's sinus rhythm as a template map allows the cardio system to automatically ignore PVCs and other beats so that manual points in addition to automatic points taken during mapping can all be used. Despite the patient's enlarged left ventricle, mapping at the basal portions of the heart under the valves is not a potential issue with the use of an RMT catheter, but sometimes can be a struggle regardless of transeptal or retrograde aortic reproach in a very dilated left ventricle. Late potentials, as identified by little black dots on the map, also indicated areas of interest with the plan to target later for ablation. Delineation of scar borders is initially performed with the RMT catheter, but will be further detailed with the Penare catheter next. Again, mapping underneath the cusps and the basal areas of the left ventricle, which in particular in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy is of importance, is not impeded with the use of a magnetic catheter and in fact makes it much easier to map these sometimes difficult to reach areas. Now that an area of scar has been delineated in the apical and anteroceptal region of the left ventricle, the RMT catheter is replaced for a pentaray catheter, which will allow to collect higher fidelity data and many more points. Again, using the patient's sinus rhythm for pattern matching allows you to quickly exclude ectopy, which can be a common problem with the pentaray catheter. Sometimes mapping the basal portions of the left ventricle via this approach can be difficult, but in this case, because we were concentrating on more apical regions, and the identification of the scar ahead of time allowed me to concentrate on this anteroceptal region to perform a high fidelity map with hundreds of points in under 10 minutes. Again, the use of the RMT catheter initially to identify the area of scar allows me to concentrate on this anteroceptal area with the pentare to identify late potentials, other interesting signals, as well as voltage abnormalities with a detailed map. The entire process from transeptal access, placement of RMT catheter for voltage map, and pentare map was performed in approximately 22 minutes. The use of the pentare also helps with delineation of those transitional zones of scarring and potential areas of interest for targeting for substrate modification. Now that a detailed anteroceptal scar map is performed with the pentaray catheter, it is switched out again for the RMT catheter to perform ablation. Ablation is performed in the left ventricle at approximately one hour from the very beginning of the case. Being able to perform a high fidelity map quickly will give me the opportunity to spend as much time as possible performing an extensive ablation in a patient who is older and has multiple comorbidities, and sometimes the ability to perform the amount of ablation necessary can be a limiting step in these procedures.
extensive areas of ablation with two minutes or more at each individual location are performed in this area of anteroseptal scar. Operator fatigue can sometimes become an issue in a ventricular tachycardia ablation, and in this case, the ability to use an RMT catheter for extensive ablation prevents this from occurring. In particular, border zone areas of both voltage abnormality as well as late potentials and fractionated signals are particularly targeted during this ablation. Unipolar voltage abnormalities were also compared to bipolar abnormalities and can show a more extensive area of scarring and in this case may represent mid-myocardial or epicardial origins of the patient's VT. Given this, extensive endocardial ablation will be required in order to make this area of scar inexcitable. In addition to manual tags that are performed during ablation by the cardiomapper, visit tags are also used with a 10 ohm impedance drop for further validation of extensive ablation. Merging of the sound shell with the voltage map that was performed gives us a more accurate endocardial electroanatomic map to assist in ablation. Ablation is performed at a high wattage for extensive periods of time with careful attention to impedance with any evidence of an impedance rise. Catheter movement is made to prevent possible steam pop. Following the ablation, the area of interest was interrogated with the ablator to look for the lack of any signals or late potentials that were earlier identified during the mapping. This is an appropriate endpoint to homogenization and substrate modification of this area of interest and scar. In addition, pacing can be performed prior to ablation and then also performed at the end of the ablation to look for the lack of capture. Amiodarone was discontinued immediately post-procedure as the patient had potential lung toxicity associated with this and has been followed in outpatient clinic and has not had any recurrent ventricular tachycardia. This outlines a process in which an ischemic ventricular tachycardia ablation can be performed safely in an older patient who has multiple comorbidities with an appropriate outcome. In addition, this workflow will allow you to efficiently perform a VT ablation in someone who being under general anesthesia for long periods of time and having a procedure performed that takes a long period of time can be associated with worse outcome.